Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Cannes Lions 2014. Now, few would disagree with the notion that the rise of the information technology era has triggered profound changes in our culture, but change is a two-way street. And as technology has become more enmeshed in contemporary culture, so too we find that culture has become a key driver of the technological process. Today, the marketing agency Translation presents a panel of some of the world's foremost authorities on consumer adoption, arbiters of what's in and what's out across the fields of business, marketing, technology and entertainment. I'm pleased to, to introduce our moderator, Stephanie Rule, who's the editor-at-large for Bloomberg News and co-host of Bloomberg Television's Market Makers. Steve Stout, the founder and chief executive of Translation and author of The Tanning of America. Ben Horowitz, co-founder of Andreessen Horowitz, a venture capital firm that has helped launch game-changing companies like Facebook, Twitter, Skype and Airbnb and the author of The Hard Thing About Hard Things and 21-time Grammy Award winner, Kanye West. So much for being here. Thank you, gentlemen. Technology, culture, consumer adoption, there is no better trio. Ben, when we think about you're an inventor, you're an innovator, you're a pioneer in technology. Kanye, you're a human brand, an artist whose cultural impact right now seems like it has no bounds. And Steve, you are the man who from Mickey D's to Jay-Z is threading the needle that is weaving these two together. So Steve, I want to start with you. Help us understand this sea change in technology, how consumers have this voice. If you think about technology back in the day, it was created for governments, for businesses. Now, it's hip hop stars, it's YouTube sensations dictating the biggest deals. Yeah, I just think that, you know, um you know, you've seen over the last uh, 10 years, 15 years, the, the usability of technology and uh, just the actual, the interface of it worked really well for consumers. And it allowed people to, uh, instead of being scared of it, use it and apply it to daily life and make their lives easier. And from democratizing entertainment, uh, to what it did to the music business and what YouTube does and to what iTunes did, you're starting to realize that you know, technology plays a very important role in everyday life. And everyday life, and, uh, and, and, and these cultural manufacturers uh, play an important role in making technology work. And how these things come together is that intersection that we all work on bridging daily. And you were early to see this. When you look at traditional technology, it didn't seem like Bill Gates was connected to the consumer. Young people now, they don't know what IBM does. They don't connect with HP. How did you see this so early? Well, it's interesting, um, right, the first computer had one customer, the US government, and then uh, the CEO of IBM famously said, the total market for computers worldwide is five. <laughs> and they're like, that's how many we're going to sell. And, and it just evolved as things got uh, cheaper and broader, um, and technology does that. It, it kind of democratizes the products and drives them down. And now uh, everybody, even you know, people in the developing world, have a computer more powerful than the five that Thomas Watson thought would get sold. Um, and you know, just having been in it for many years, since the 80s and the beginning days of the internet, uh, you could see where it was going. And then the real turning point um, for a company that stopped selling technology to technology companies uh, was a company that I was at called Netscape, which sort of uh, consumerized the internet. And we dealt with the very early kind of issues that you're talking about, like, oh, okay, now regular people are using these products. We're not selling them to a computer manufacturer. 
Kanye, you said to the New York Times, you could be to culture what Steve Jobs has been to the internet in terms of music, fashion, art. How do you connect them all? Well, I mean, Steve Jobs, as everyone knows, is like my biggest influence. And just seeing the way that he fought to make things easier for people. And there's, you know, after he passed, uh, a lot of people here saw these, like, uh, these tweets that I sent out where I just made it my life's mission to do what he did inside of that company to take my position as, you know, being visual and influential to help. Um, see, I don't want to say these really big, over the top statements that end up getting quoted like in the we wrong way. We appreciate that. We appreciate that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, I, I dream to uh, help raise the, raise the palate, I mean, raise the taste level of, um, of a generation, of a, and, uh, and also be involved with the production and, you know, distribution and advertising of, you know, providing that, that thing that everyone's begging for whether it's like making sure, you know, we took the, the labels off the water because you know it's water. You know, I called Spike Jones, who's here with me today, after I saw her and I said, it's a scene where this owl is coming up behind Joaquin. And, I, and it reminded me of a, a film that we shot and um, that we showed here in Cannes a couple years ago. And I said, what did, you, what did you mean by that? He's like, this is my take on advertising in the future, not having brands, and you're just understanding what it is, like a, a Guy Bourdain photo or a Helmut Lang photo that you know it, and you don't have to put something by it, or the fact that you know, with smartphones, you can just hold your phone up and know what that billboard is. And uh, it's like a Tumblr generation. And I said, these kids are like saying these things back to back, these certain color palettes back to back. Uh, uh, shapes that they want back to back, and it doesn't have to deal with big branding. And I was at like this clothing, uh, this fashion house, this like older fashion house, and this guy was telling me how you wouldn't sell T-shirts unless they had words on them. And I said, well, now Where's it's the like, beef? yeah, you know, like it just anything. And I said, now people are more less about the brands and the brands wearing them, but more about you know self, you know, confidence and how the brands can assist them, and and that's what's similar to what Steve was doing with tech. And that's the reason why I make those comparisons to say that, you know, this is my goal in, in lifestyle and everyday life to change the idea of what luxury, because time is the only, time is the only luxury. It's not this, these, you know, all these brands that we just drove by that are somehow selling our esteem back to us through association, you know. Are consumers more powerful today than ever because of technology, because of smartphones and iPads and the evolution of news and social media? We don't have to just take what's delivered to us. We have more power than ever. I, w I would say absolutely because it's clear. I mean, consumers are making brands overnight now. There, there were time when, you know, brands could force themselves on you because there was not enough uh, media outlets, enough opportunity for you, to, for you to get exposed to other brands. And now, because of the internet, uh, the opportunity for convenience, different e-commerce companies or different brands that are formed because of the internet generation, they are now actually putting some of these bigger brands that you thought would, were too big to fail, they're starting to feel the effect of failure because they're, they, they're not meeting the consumer on their terms and they have not uh, kept up the speed with the, the, the digital world that we live in today. Ben, does this put you on your heels? Because developed technology businesses right now can be rocked overnight by someone who doesn't like what you're delivering, and they can create their own. Um, well, that is the terror of the technology business. You, know, you got no cushion. Yeah, there, there's, no, <laughs> there's no relief. So kind of technology means, um, kind of from an etymological standpoint, it means a better way of doing things. And so if you're in the business of a better way of doing things, um, and as Kanye said, the, like, the only thing that's actually valuable is time, and you're kind of making something better, you know, faster, more convenient, easier to use, then there's always somebody who's going to try to make a better way of doing things than what you're doing. So you, you're in a very short product cycle life. And if you don't continue to innovate, um, then you're absolutely going to die. And that's one of the 
kind of big clashes that we've had in technology world with like um, the newspaper industry because we look at that and we go, wow, that was a 400-year product cycle. They had plenty of time to prepare for a, a better way of newspaper delivery, you know, what was going on. But it's a kind of a different mindset when you're in it day-to-day uh, -day knowing that you could turn over at any moment. This whole idea to be part of the conversation, is it too much? Are consumers creating too much noise? Kanye, you have 10 and a half million Twitter followers. And this is very romantic. You follow one person, your wife. <laughs> <laughs> you're not necessarily part of a social media conversation. It seems that you're the, the voice, and you are dictating an opinion, a style. Do you need to be in a conversation, or it's too noisy? Uh, well, ju yeah, just in my opinion, which I'm not trying to force on anyone else, I, I do think it's really noisy, and it's interesting what he was saying about newspapers having, you know, all that time to develop, and us being in a, a fast food of information and tech, and people are just racing to you know, get the next product out, get the next song on the radio, and things don't have the time to you know, incubate and develop and become something that people you know, fully understand and that grows within itself. Uh, so yeah, I think it is. I, I think it's, it's way too fast. Like even, you know, I, I'll tell you just a little, the story about uh, the, the kiss photo that my girl put up. Like, we at Donda, you know, and this was pissing my girl off during the honeymoon because <laughs> she said she was exhausted because we worked on the photo so much because Annie Leibovitz had like pulled out right before the wedding because I think she was like scared of the, you know, the idea of celebrity you got and everything. Recently? Yeah. What? <laughs> so, Congratulations. So, in order, so I just, I blatantly said, and I'm the guy that's like, no, I want to go directly to Mirakami. I want to go to, directly to Snobble. I want to go directly to Kondo or whatever. But because Annie pulled out, I had to be like, okay, I still want my wedding photos to look like Annie Leibovitz. And we sat there and worked on that photo for, you know, like four days because the, the flowers were off colored and stuff like that. And can you imagine like telling someone who wants to just Instagram a photo that's like the number one person on Instagram, we need to work on the color of the flower wall. Or the idea that it was a Givenchy dress inside of that. And it wasn't about the name Givenchy, it was about the talent that Ricardo Tichy is and then how important, you know, Kim is to, you know, uh, you know, the internet and the fact that the, the number one most liked photo has a certain aesthetic on it was a win for, you know, what the mission is of raising the palette, you know. Yeah. Steve, think about this for a moment. And it took a long time. That was the point. I believe yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, let me make one comment on yeah. that because that, that description was amazing yeah. and then yeah. the result was amazing. But th this reminds me of something that, that Steve told me. So when, when Kanye, uh, had made, first made the kind of Steve Jobs comparison. A lot of people didn't understand it. And then when I, but I, I spoke to Steve about it, and he said, you have to realize Kanye's already been the Steve Jobs of music because he does what Steve Jobs does in, in technology, which is he takes a tremendous amount of complexity and he makes it accessible to everybody. And then he brings the future of music forward by a year so that everybody can get to it. And I think, you know, for people who haven't understood why that analogy makes sense, that's it. You know, that, that attention to detail, that vision that nobody else has, the ability to see things that nobody else does. And that um, is a really interesting connection, at least from my point of view, between the two worlds. You know, oh, sorry. But, well, to add to, to, to what Ben just said, and the, the, the biggest issue or the biggest thing that Kanye has done, uh, being a former record uh, executive and, and our advertising guy, is his ability to collaborate and bring different worlds together. And, you know, that people, we were asking ourselves this question, like why do industries that are codependent on each other find ways not to work together? Why do these guys who are holding on to yesteryear decide that they don't want to partner with the new, guy, the new young guy or the other industry? Why did Andy Leibovitz pull out the day before the wedding? Well, because I'm not someone even, told them, you, you know, know, like. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and the nature of. She's not going to get any more weddings <laughs> to book after that. Yeah, but <laughs> the nature of collaboration is, 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 is super valuable. And, you know, with tech and culture coming together, you know, the tech guys are like robots. They were like, yo, we do this, we do that, we make the perfect product, and we don't need marketing, and we don't need culture, and those things really have nothing to do with us. And now you're starting to realize, or you're starting to see, and I think 
the Apple Beats deal is just the, the lead indicator that culture is going to start playing a much more important role in marketing uh, technology and uh, uh, the role that it plays in just content development itself. And I think that's a good thing. I think we're just at the point of seeing this collaboration come together. Apple and Beats, Pinterest, Airbnb, these are designers who are now leading technology. Ben, do you see that as the way we're headed? Well, I think that it's a very important aspect to the way that we're headed. So if you look at uh, Brian Chesky from Airbnb or Ben Silberman from Pinterest, um, they have, th th there's a real kind of, they're almost the intersection between the two worlds in that they're doing the kind of same thing, which Steve Jobs really, at his essence, you know, was a designer, um, which is taken a world of tremendous complexity and tremendous change and deliver something that's incredibly useful and interesting and, and important and beautiful. And that's um, why the relationships end up making uh, so much sense if you have the top creative people working with the top technology people. Now, um, it's not always, we're in the really early days of technology for consumers. Um, and so if you just think about other industries and how long it took them, the auto industry, for example, you know, Henry Ford popularized the automobile by two things, right? It's going to be cheaper and more high quality. Um, but he didn't get, and, all, and every car, he famously said, you can have any color you want on your car as long as it's black. And nobody mm -hmm. challenged him on that for 20 years till GM challenged him on it and started offering you cars and colors uh, that would compete. Which um, I totally disagree with. I think they should be. They should be black. Well, just, the, <laughs> just the metal. It shouldn't be any paint on it. It should just be yeah. like silver. That's my opinion. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but it just kind of. <laughs> that's a very interesting comment. But um, yeah. it, it gives you kind of an idea of how long it, it takes for an industry to kind of really understand the consumer. And so, for the companies that can understand it now, they have a real chance to win. It's not table stakes to understand culture and consumers. For technology companies, it's like dramatic competitive advantage right now. And, and so that's, one thing I that's wanna, an exciting opportunity. The main thing for culture and where the discrimination and the reason why so many people don't collaborate is the thing that controls the reason why people, you know, go to school and try to get a certain job and try to get that certain car and that certain house is before there was racism, it's classism. And it's something that technology completely broke that because, you know, you look crazy. No knock to the Virtu company if they're still around, I don't know. But it's like you look crazy trying to, like, outclass somebody with a $6,000 Virtu phone. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like you're out-assing somebody, really, you know. And it's like... But when we fight, and I go in and I'm considered to be a celebrity, I'm you know, building relationships inside of the fashion world, and people say, well, why is fashion so important? Well, because it's trained thinkers of taste. And they are like, like Stockholm is a city that's like trained thinkers of, like the entire city is like, mm -hmm. they, like a, 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 a six month baby gets a, a camera in his hand, becomes a photographer or something, <laughs> gets a leather jacket on or something. So, uh, but the fashion world is like trained, they're like, you know, like the movie Sparta, like what do you do? And they're like, rah, 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 of like <laughs> fonts. And like, uh, you know, so the reason why I've been trying to, you know, build relationships in that world is to bring it over because when people think celebrity, which is the highest form of communication, we're like walking networks or TV shows or brands in ourselves, you don't think, you know, good taste. And I believe that bad taste is vulgar. It's like, it's like cursing. And I, and I think that the world can be saved design, through design because what is the most distasteful thing someone can do? Kill someone. So good taste is the opposite of that. So do you think it's insulting, for example? <laughs> the grand that, unification theory right there. There you, you go. I mean, we have to have a pause on that. Is it insulting that so many people in the tech world or the media mm. said, Dr. Dre and Jimmy are so lucky that this Beats Apple deal happened, mm. when in reality, they're the designers, they're the industry experts. This is the way we should be going. That's, I, I think that everybody's seeing it wrong. When anyone who's saying that is seeing it wrong. You know, uh, uh, Beats, within the last six years, built this incredible business around headphones and, you know, took something that was just laying around that was 
earbuds. I mean, honestly, the Apple earbuds, not only did they not sound that great, but they, they just looked okay. And they tried to bring some design language and some colors and some lifestyle to some headphones, and they tr d uh, developed tremendous buzz all around the world, going into Germany, beating the leader, going into different markets and just dominating quickly. And Apple seen that coming. They were, those headphones were selling initially like the iPod itself. And that was driven completely by culture and music videos and artists and you know, athletes all gravitating towards this thing. And Apple was losing some of that. So of course they wanted to hook up with the guys who was leading uh, and bridging that gap between culture and, and, and technology. It made perfect sense. And I am a believer that that's just the beginning of where this thing goes. You're gonna see a lot more collaborations like that. And hopefully that, that Apple did it opens the door for, for other brands to look at a guy like Kanye West or other leaders in culture and say, you know what, I wanna partner with you and I don't, I don't wanna just pay you some money and rent your services. I actually wanna give you a piece of the action and have you be a part of my company because I think you can help me make a difference. Right, and, and to kind of put a, a kind of, to reinforce what Steve is saying kind of just from a financial standpoint, if you look at um, Apple as a company, it's about 10% of phones worldwide and about 50%, over 50% of the profits of those units. And so it's kind of a classic, it's, a, it's a, at the largest scale, but it's an aspirational brand. It's not something that everybody has, um, but it's something that when anybody gets, it's extremely valuable to the company. And to have the ability to kind of expand the number of people who to aspire to that brand is an unbelievably valuable thing. And they paid 30 days worth of cash flow for Beats. I mean, like everybody's like, oh, $3, three billion, that's so much money, but it's 30 days of cash flow for those guys. And so, you know, to, for that, to have the opportunity to extend the brand beyond the people who already uh, associate with Apple is an amazing, like, upside opportunity that's way underestimated. And, uh, you know, and <laughs> Steve's point about, like, this is, these guys can, you know, people with that kind of creative force and that kind of cultural relevancy can really move things. I was just telling my wife today, I was like, I didn't even know what Margiela was till Kanye asked me, you know, what was that jacket? So, <laughs> you know, but that's the thing. Nobody knew what it was, and now everybody knows what it is. Is that one of the reasons hip hop has grown so exponentially? It's the first genre in the music industry that bridged lifestyle and, and selling product. Run DMC saying, hold up your Adidas sneakers, wear your track suits. Will I Am in 2009 in Boom Boom Pow talking about Beats headphones. Was it the first genre of music that said, you like my style, I'm gonna sell it to you? Yeah, because black people are allowed to wear like big chains and, and name what they have on and, and say out loud what stuff costs. Because, you know, <laughs> it's why? part of, <laughs> it's why? Part why, of the, why wasn't Mick Jagger selling me skinny pants 30 years ago? It just, it just was uncool at that time. It'll go through waves and stuff. We'll go through waves of civilization where it'll not, not be as cool anymore. Like on my last album, you know, I completely took the, the uh, I used to be known as the Louis Vuitton Don and this and I would, and I would name drop all these, uh, you know, people by association, like how I name dropped Spike Jones earlier to like make myself look cooler. Like that's my friend, you know? <laughs> like, so, so it's all this like by association thing that people, you know, gain their own confidence and found that, you know, have the time to just spend it on their family and less time to just, you know, spend in stores. One thing I wanted to point out with Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre, it's not, they are geniuses. Both of them were cultural geniuses, what they had done for so many years, and they just, they, they connected with the right company, by the way. It's all about the legacy of Steve. Like, you know, there'll be tech guys that come to me and say, well, Apple doesn't have the biggest, you know, market share here, or this, that, but they have the right principles, and we need to base the rest, I personally, in my opinion, I'm not trying to force, want to base our future civilization next to companies with the, right principles, if we start with the right principles and go from there. And something that's funny about what color, I think color is like a big branding tool, but sometimes also it's the lowest hanging fruit too. Like let's just make it, you know, red is like my favorite color as a kid or so. Let's just make it a color that, uh, you know, people like, like what's our new idea? 
oh, we've got another color. So one thing, I, I totally disagree when Apple came out with those colored phones. I'm like, no, Steve would never do this. In, in my mind, I would think he would never, you know. I like the fact that it's just more natural, like colors are just from, uh, from nature. I'm just throwing out design ideas or influence when I have this platform, so. Steve, I, I feel like just sitting here, authenticity and passion is what the three of you are, are really representing. Yeah. Help us understand how and when the right partnerships work. You are integral in Jay-Z and Samsung, and we saw everyone had an Apple phone. Suddenly, Jay-Z partners with Samsung, and that same Apple customer said, I gotta get myself a Galaxy. I'm not a big fan of Samsung, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> but go ahead. Well, <laughs> There goes the neighborhood. He wasn't going to make any overarching statements today, the right? Yeah. There you guys, we got two. We got Andy Leibovitz yeah. and Samsung. Yeah. We have another 20 minutes. Don't worry about it. I'm sorry, but yeah. I am a fan of Andy, though. So. This is why he's the most authentic brand. He always tells the truth, whether it's good for him or not. The, uh, well, the most important part of any relationship is shared values. What do you have, what is authentically you, brand, and what is authentically us, and why should we come together and partner? How could that partnership be mutually beneficial? And what you see a lot of times are relationships that have zero shared values. So there is no authentic bond other than the fact that somebody could write somebody else a big check. And when you see those type of relationships form, it's nothing more than an expensive mess. Um, we like to stay very highly focused on bringing relationships together that take those shared values and, uh, and articulate them in a very profound way. And those are the great relationships that have taken place that has you know, helped build our business. And I think that whether it be a transaction between an artist and a brand or a transaction between you know, culture and technology itself, find those shared values and build that model around that. And I, that's, the, that's what we want, we're here to drive today. Like, let's talk about collaboration, let's talk about finding what we have in common and how those commonalities can make the world better, not looking at those things and saying, you know what, because he took a different journey from me, I don't respect that, so therefore I'm not gonna collaborate. But how does the yeah. consumer know it? How do they feel it? We weren't thinking about Samsung and we bought into it, yet when BlackBerry had their back against the wall and they roll out Alicia Keys as their creative director, immediately the consumer said, that's not authentic, I'm not buying it. How do they know? <laughs> <laughs> 10,000 hours. Uh, well, Alicia Keys is not the right fit to be the creative director for BlackBerry. I mean, that was obviously BlackBerry trying a last ditch attempt to see who its celebrity they could get attached to to do something. I mean, that, that, that's not fair to, I mean, Alicia Keys did that, but it wasn't necessarily, she was set up to fail. The but I guess that's what I don't understand. Like, how, how do we understand what relationships are set up to fail and where are the partnerships going to be golden? Well, I, I actually think what Kanye said earlier explains the BlackBerry one very well, which is uh, that company didn't have the right principles um, for an artist like that to uh, make something like that work. And that, you know, they had spent the last several years resisting the future and denying, like, what had just happened, and so you get the company to that point, you're not in a place where, where you're gonna kind of pull it out in that way. Um, so it has to be, the artist has to be authentic or the, or the creative person has to be authentic, but the company's gotta be authentic too. And, and you know, BlackBerry had just been a company that lost their way. And, and actually, and, I mean, look, and saying Alicia Keys is the creative director of a technology company, <laughs> is, that's not a believable idea either. No, you know, I mean, that's just not believable. <laughs> yeah. Why do you want me to say the stuff that like, gets in. everybody in trouble? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's just obvious. It's just ridiculous to have, like, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, to just give someone, a, anyone, not particularly Alicia Keys, but just any, you know, celebrity, uh, a creative director role of anything. It's just only, you know, maybe I'm think, not thinking of a couple, but there's only like three guys that I think could even possibly work, you know, consistently in that, and that's Ryan Leslie, me, and Will I Am, because we care about it, you know, like we're, 
it, you know, we're inside of it, you know, so. I want to talk about Tanning of America for a moment, your book, your documentary. You are saying this is such an important time, Steve, because this generation is looking at the world in a completely different way. Do we actually, why is that? This is a time where we spend all of our time talking about disruptive innovation. When Albert Einstein was a disruptive innovator, Ben did a whole lot of great things 15 years ago. Why is it now that these millennials are the greatest thing? I think everybody here is pretty great. I think the, the, I think the, the the new the new consumer where the money is at is always going to be the new interesting thing to figure out. Uh, the tanning of America speaks basically about the principles of where hip hop culture has fully got the next generation of kids to not see the world through color. They just start seeing each other through shared values. I remember I first came here mm -hmm. 16 years ago and I seen graffiti and I was like I came to Cannes and I seen graffiti. I felt great. I felt, oh, this is comfortable, this is New York City. I, I understand this. And it's like, that's what hip hop culture did. It, it kind of brought together global culture for those who understood it. And it grew over the last 25 years. So yeah, it feels great to know that no matter where you go, there you are, if you are part uh, subscriber to hip hop culture. And we see millennials um, come out all around the world and support it. In America, you know, I, I draw a line directly that hip hop culture is the reason why a young generation, whether white, black, or Hisp uh, Hispanic, voted for the first African American president. Yeah. I was just thinking about the presidency, because uh, I wanted to go back to the Samsung comment and the tanning, <laughs> the tanning of America and the class comment, and, and talk about all three of these things at once and how hip hop is encompassing and breaks through style, uh, branding, information, uh, poetry, uh, melody, storyline, uh, all at one time, and the reason why I completely crushed the R&B genre, and why I became the new rock and roll, and the reason why me and Jay Z sat in front of a uh, you know American flag is because I was looking at Bruce Springsteen covers and saying, okay, we're America makes the best music from traveling around the world. I'm like, okay, it, Italy makes the best suits, and this makes the best blah blah. blah. But America brings the the greatest pop stars and the greatest music, and that's why me and Jay Z sat in front of it. And what I want to point out with the Samsung deal is there would have been no Beats deal without the Samsung deal because it showed, now that Steve has passed, even though Steve might have seen it, it showed a, a, a number one company the importance of connecting with culture. And I, I know you might have heard about this thing where I was, I was on stage like calling Tim Cook out and saying, why do you have uh, you know, these guys performing at South by Southwest and you don't want to pay them and you just want to give us like extra space on the iTunes page and stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, Samsung realized the whole point of what we're saying is that, no, you have to go and pay these guys. That's and right. That culture and creativity is worth something. And the best thing about the fall of BlackBerry and the rise of Apple is the win for creativity and companies that are based off the idea and that just based off of uh, the amount of product that they can put out, you know? Ben, what is involved in... Oh, I'm sorry, I missed one point about sorry. the presidency. Yeah. The reason why I said I didn't like Samsung particularly is because throughout my entire life, because of the way my parents raised me, I, I was like, no, I have to work with the number one. I can't work with anyone but Jay-Z because that's the number one, blah, blah, blah. I can't be with any girl but Kim because that's the girl that... I look at her pictures the most and get turned on the most, and she's a nice <laughs> person. And like, I can't work with, you know, you know, any, I'm not gonna represent any company but Louis Vuitton, because that's the number one. And in a way, it's like, before Obama, there was, uh, you know, Jesse Jackson, there was different people that, or blacks particularly, we talk about the tanning of America, that were not allowed to drink from the cleanest fountain to work with the best resources. Michelangelo not being allowed to carve with marvel, but to, you know, he's gotta use cement or something like that. So, you know, yes, Samsung was not quite, you know, Apple, but it showed that Jimmy and Dre were then able to connect with the number one, you know, influencers. So, yeah. the, 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 so yeah. to, to that, just yeah. the, 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 the big part about that that I gravitate towards, mm. and I hope we all, get is like, you had a company at Apple that was so profound at making great products and great design language, but yet they found themselves culturally susceptible to another brand whose products weren't necessarily as great at that time, 
but they use culture as a way to get in the conversation. And that's why the Apple Beats deal makes sense because now whatever Samsung is doing to get like a Jay-Z one-off or whatever they're doing culturally, these little bits and uh, pieces, they got the 800-pound gorilla in Beats and Jimmy and Dre. Yeah, and that's my big thing. I hate the one-off. You know, celebrities, a lot of times we're treated, because I am like, like multiple things, but I am a celebrity. And you know, we're treated as, you know, sometimes, you know, rentable, like the one-off just enough to advertise the product and you know, get it out and then get out of here. Yeah, but many celebrities put themselves in that position. They make themselves for rent. Yeah, but then when you're not that one that's for rent, you, know, you go through you know, 30 meetings with the owner of the Clippers and stuff, so. It's <laughs> ben, I feel like you want to weigh in here. It's a, I, well, I'm enjoying the conversation very much. I mean, like, but but I, I, I think actually Kanye hit on what's uh, important about translation, which is um, being able to tell the difference between uh, what you, you know, Alicia Keys as the creative director versus what Kanye was saying about, you know, Will I Am Kanye and Ryan Leslie are three people who have invested like a tremendous amount of time in really, really understanding technology products and how they evolve and and uh, what's going on. To find, I think Ryan Leslie like learned how to write code in Ruby and like has developed software and so forth. And Kanye's done a tremendous amount of work on design and studying what's going on. And if you just walk into it and say everybody's a celebrity. Um, you have no idea, you could make a giant mistake like that. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it helps to have, you know, you really have to know what you're doing. I guess uh, in summary, you really have to know what you're doing. And this is, um, this is why the work that Steve does is so important, because if you get it right, it's incredibly powerful. And if you get it wrong, it's really embarrassing. Steve, when Kanye mentioned the Clippers, it made me think of the Dodgers. You once said, trends come and go, but cool is forever. When you saw the investment group buy the Dodgers, they needed Magic Johnson to be the face, to lead the charge. Go ahead. Do brands, do, do, is it because a pack of nerds can't win a city, a community over? You've got to have that iconic face like a Magic Johnson to close the I think that's kind deal. of insulting to call them a pack of nerds and stuff there. Like, but I'm but saying <laughs> that's the brand, right? They're saying, well, hold on, time out. We're all over the place here. Hold on. <laughs> Let's do it. Right. The guys who bought Guggenheim, mm -hmm. who bought the Dodgers, are not necessarily a pack of nerds. They have some nerds, and they got a lot of money, right? <laughs> <laughs> but they're not a pack of nerds. <laughs> They were told that that was a bad investment and there were a lot of things in the deal that nobody seen. So everybody looked at the value of, uh, the value of a baseball team. People weren't paying attention to the value of the parking lot or the value of the television rights deal that was coming up. And within six months of doing the deal, they did a $20 billion, a $20 billion deal with Time Warner. Some, no, I'm sorry, $10 billion deal with Time Warner and they got the Dodgers games for the next 20 years or something like that. But they, they got their money back in that transaction. Having Magic Johnson be a part of it, I think it was, you know, because Magic Johnson is the face of Los Angeles as far as sports is concerned. To move him over to the baseball team, it's the right goodwill uh, and the right good thing to do. I'm not necessarily sure they needed him in order to pull that team off, but it was the right thing to do for the city of Los Angeles in a, in a goodwill kind of way, like, hey, we're buying a team. I know you don't know who we are, but we got this, the, the ambassador of sports in Los Angeles, Magic Johnson, down with us. And if he endorses us, then I know you'll be understanding of our presence of owning your baseball team. I think it's as simple as, as that. I want to talk a little bit about creating products from nowhere, and then in a very short amount of time, those products being essential as part of our culture. If you look at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, if you look at what Bitcoin is trying to do, how does that transpire when entrepreneurs create something that no one did before and no one cares about? Yeah, it actually uh, kind of is the nature of innovation. And um, it's funny, it's one of the things that, that, that made me realize like how the innovation kind of crosses disciplines. But you know, we have a saying that at the firm is we don't look for good ideas um, because 
good ideas are things that everybody thinks are a good idea, and then like everybody's doing them or it's already done, or it's not really a breakthrough. We look for bad ideas or, or things that look like bad ideas that are actually good ideas underneath because it's those ideas that everybody dismisses that says, you know, which everything you name just about Bitcoin, what, like artificial money, like it's not backed up by the, you know, you can't pay your taxes in it, all these things. Or Facebook at the time was, you're going to market a product to only Harvard students. Um, that sounds like a really bad idea. But if it's really a breakthrough, all real innovation looks crazy at the time that it's made, because that's what breakthrough thinking is. It's something that nobody else can see. It's something that, uh, that's just not obvious. And um, you know, that's you know, the great thing about the world right now, in my opinion, is the ability for kind of very small groups of people or even single individuals to make breakthroughs that impact everybody uh, and uh, really advance the world. Um, but that's, that's always what, it, it never looks like, oh yeah, that looks like a genius idea. It always looks like, why would you do that? And then, oh my God, like that's changed the world. What kind of gut or iron conviction do you have to have to be one of those breakthrough innovators? When you did, was it six months ago, Bound 2, Kanye? Those first few mm -hmm. days, people said, what is this? Is he making fun of me? And a week later, sociology professors were teaching courses about this video saying it's genius. What kind of gut do you need to have to say, I'm gonna stick this out. I know this is the way we're going. I, you know, I, I don't like write self-help books or anything like that. It's just, <laughs> you, you just, you, you have to be able to take the, take the lashes of people not understanding. You know, uh, two years of people not understanding uh, uh, interracial relationship like that. Two years of people not understanding uh, the idea of the art world meets uh, the pop world. Uh, you have to be able to take the lashes and be able to swim and backlash. And a lot of times, you know, I, I think that I, I get a bad rap for saying, I could do this, I could do this. But, but it, it's like, well, we are like are the creatives with teeth. So we have the gut feeling and we know that the idea is more important than our personal well-being. That's the reason why I, a lot of times I'll say things that are not for my personal well-being, which I think is a, for people to create for their personal well-being is a very selfish way to create. And you're creating to make your life better as opposed to creating to make everybody's life better. So, the, you know, the only thing I think I could be an inspiration to create is, is the fact that I get bashed so much but create so much. So it's like just know if you really want to be a boxer, you're going to get your face beat in, you know, constantly. But then you might end up being Mayweather or Ali, you know, at the end of it. Because I steal from the, I still take like, bashing from the Bound video. And I always say, but if the Vogue had came out before the Bound video, everybody would have been like, oh, it's okay. And that's with the endorsement. We hadn't got the endorsement yet from you know, something established like Vogue to make everything okay. It's like when we had the wedding, I was like, oh, great, yes, that's cool now. Because you know, we were told by people who endorsed it. Like, I couldn't have rapped if Jay-Z didn't endorse me. I couldn't, uh, Eminem wouldn't have been as successful if uh, Dr. Dr. Dre. Dre hadn't endorsed them. And, yeah. So, Stephanie, mm. with, this whole mm. can line is about creativity. Mm. It's about the create creatives in the digital and advertising industry, the media industries itself. And, you know, we wrote over here with Spike and uh, Spike Jones and Kanye, and we were speaking about creativity and just, I mean, these are established creative geniuses but yet still, right now, people question them, who know that they're clearly proven creative geniuses and they still have to deal with the backlash. So it's just the nature of, I guess, a, a good idea, to Ben's point, when it just sounds, when it's breakthrough and it doesn't make sense to you, but it's in the hands of guys who've created breakthrough moments in, in the past, then you need to give it up to those guys. And I, I've always wanted to be the executive that understood if this guy dressed like this and he made all those hit records, my job was to try to get him to dress like this every day. Mm. Because all I wanted was him to be comfortable to make those records or create those fashion lines or build those technologies or Spike making those films. 
that's what's important. That's how great businessmen can help force the creativity. And, and the business guys have to take some responsibility for that. You can't say you want to be a creative company and then the CEO or the CFO don't understand how to make that business model work. So they just simply say no because they can't afford it or don't want to afford it. You got to give these guys a chance to create. So, I mean, I hope just Kanye's presence here today and him even speaking about the fact that he still deals with these headwinds and yet he's proven himself gives everybody inspiration in knowing that if you are, people are saying you're wrong, that, that probably is a good sign that you're a genius. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wanted to talk about Spike's. How many people here have seen her with a uh, show of hands? So any, it's, it's impossible, like if you're in design, you have to see her because it's a real thought out take of where we could be you know, in the future, and I called Spike right away. I was like, this is the reason why I was like working on the Jetsons project, because I felt like it was important to show people, because if you don't have the vision, you have to show, and how do you show people through movies? It's like so many investments go into things that people have seen in Star Trek or Star Wars, and it just showed us, you know, how seamless, we, what could be scary about it also, but how seamless you could be uh, in, with, in technology, and just our, you know, my place from an aesthetic, uh, you know, company is just that, once again, you know, bad taste is vulgar. Bad taste is like a curse word. And, you know, when I was, when I was in grammar school, it was almost like you got ridiculed for having good taste or wanting to learn about taste. Or when I, when I went to Valentino's home and just, it just blew, I was staying at hotels that I thought were nice until I went to Valentino's home and it just raised my palate to the, the level of what we can deliver. And if, if people just have a common understanding of that, you know, we can stop playing off of people's ignorance of bad taste, you know, uh, ignorance of taste, mm -hmm. and just provide water bottles with no, uh, you know, mm -hmm. with no branding on it. I mean, the internet as a whole is, the world as a whole is fucking ugly. You know, but the internet as a whole is fucking ugly too. But, you know, I'm not in a construction business, you know. So that means it, it's, I know more people that can help repaint. You know, when I went to, you know, Kevin, I was like, yo, why don't you help let us, you know, kind of redo Instagram. But Instagram is, is, is it's, it's nice. It's nice looking. I'm not knocking it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but just in general, it's like everyone spends the majority of their time looking at these screens or looking at their phone. And, you know, just as a simple task, we could clean that up. We can all hold hands together and, you know, and collect, you know, collectively collaborate, which is something I talked about at my wedding, because Steve McQueen was sitting right down from Fernaz, who is a producer of my girl's show, who also produced The Real World. I'm like, okay, Steve McQueen, you cannot argue, has the highest sensibility. This guy is not even a photographer, he's just an, you know, an artist, like, he doesn't even like to be called, and he went into a different field and won an Oscar. And he understood how to work in these different areas. And then we have Kareen Raphael sitting right down from my mother-in-law, Chris, and Kim. And I remember when Kareen lost her job at Vogue, she wrote Irreverent. And I came over to Kim's house, and I was like, this is the Bible right here. Kareen is the reason why girls wear ripped jeans with heels. And she put that in Vogue, the way girls look on Tumblr and everything. So when I say the collaboration, think about this, just this idea of cleaning the internet up. Right here, in Cannes, right now, we have enough people with sensibility and connections to completely make that a more beautiful place. That is our, people talk about where's our future, where's our flying cars. That is the world that's floating above us right now. And we can make that, you know, beautiful with the people in Cannes right now. Yeah. Ben, then would you say our takeaway, I'm yeah. sitting here with three iconic figures yeah. all in their own fields, and each one of you have just spoken about other people. Is collaboration the true key to success? Because the business you're in now, you're finding all of these beautiful seeds and turning them into extraordinary trees. Well, I think it's very powerful. I mean, I, th I think it's extremely powerful and it's a, you know, it, it helps you get to a breakthrough because when you, when you go a kind of across different ways of thinking and, and different worlds, then you see something that nobody's seen before and kind of going back to why uh, you know, Kanye is a great interviewer, and he actually like the, the the number one thing we look for 
um, in an entrepreneur is courage. And you can hear why, like, you need a lot of courage to do what he does. Um, but it, it kind of goes back to uh, something that's told to me very early on, which is, do you know the difference between a vision and a hallucination? And they call it a vision when other people can see it. Steve, before we go, I know we're out of time. That was dope, man. That was dope, actually. Yeah. That was dope. It was. It was. I like that. Nobody was like, did that go on there? Everybody said, like, I, damn, that was nice. This is why he's the godfather. <laughs> Before we go, I want you to just talk about collaboration for a moment. Is the reason it's so special is because it's not self-serving. The reason music festivals are doing so well right now is because it's artists celebrating one another. When you would put together Made in the USA, is the reason it worked is because it wasn't about an individual getting on stage for his or her audience. It was about a group effort, a community. And with the exception of disruptive innovation, community seems like one of the most important terms right now. Yeah, well. So it was, we put together a festival called Made in America, and it was about bringing genres of music together that ordinarily wouldn't play, people wouldn't necessarily see them all coming together. So when you put, uh, you know, all these, and then the fans of these genres, they come together, what comes out of it is people getting exposed to new things they would not necessarily be exposed to. And that's what it's all about, uh, cultural curiosity. You know, being interested in finding something Finding out new, uh, finding out something new about something that you were not necessarily interested in, but you're curious to find out what it's all about. And collaboration brings these things together in a way that makes beautiful sounds and beautiful pictures. Um, one of his songs, people take it for granted, like All of the Lights, the, the amount of background singers that he has from different genres of music is just amazing. It's how many people are singing on that song? Alicia Keys. Uh, Alicia Keys is one of them. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, proper use though. of Alicia but, Keys. But you have, you have, proper use of Alicia but, you have a, but you have a bunch of people coming together, collaborating to make something beautiful. There were 12 people on that song because I couldn't find the answer. Meaning like so many times, I'm sure a lot of you guys are, you have to deliver the product before you found the answer. And I kept at it, Dream, Elton John, Rihanna, Drake, uh, Kid Cudi, Fergie, uh, so many people, uh, Q-Tip worked on this song until we found the answer. And then now it's like, in my opinion, one of uh, my, my greatest sonic landscapes. And it was because it took two and a half years and I had all these people. So I wanna just circle back on this idea again really quick, and uh, excuse me for taking Please. the floor on this one. But th Rome wasn't built in a day, but the internet is our new Rome. But it's time for the best visual artists, the best content creators to be empowered. And you, I told Spike, we joked around and said people always talk about likability, and it's like, empower the best content creators or fuck you. <laughs> you know, it's like. <laughs> it's, he wasn't talking it's the motto. Me, <laughs> not, not you particularly, but you know, just. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to end on empower on the note. greatest <laughs> content creators or fuck you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so, I mean, an yeah. honor. An yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephanie Rule, Steve Stout, Ben Horowitz, and of course, Kanye West. Thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. Fantastic. Thank you very much, as usual, Steve. Nicely done. You're the man. Okay.